Hey, and welcome to Church Anywhere. My name is Megan, and I'm one of the pastors here. Happy New Year. We are so glad you're starting this year off with us here at Church Anywhere. Did you make a New Year's resolution this year? If so, drop it in the comments. Or maybe you're like me, and you have a word for the year. If that's you, drop your word in the comments. This year, my word is freedom. The word freedom for me means every day I am working to free myself from the heaviness of anxiety. You can follow me on my journey too. Check out the Real Talk with Megan blog on the Church Anywhere website. Service is getting ready to start in just a minute. So now would be a great time to grab your communion supplies. Today, Patrick will be sharing what it means to have a true relationship with the living God. So wherever you're watching from, get ready because Church Anywhere starts right now. Well, hey everyone, welcome to church. We're so glad you're here with us today. Today, we're in the Father's house. Wherever you're watching us from, you are in the Father's house. So we're gonna sing about that today. Let's stand, come on. Sometimes on this journey, get lost in my mistakes. What looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength. My story isn't over, my story's just begun. Fear you won't define me, cause that's what my father does. Fear.
Amen. Well, hey, that's a fun way to start out um, today. We're just so glad that you're here with us, whether you're here in person, welcome. Um, if you're joining us in our Church Anywhere locations online, welcome to you as well. And just thank you. We're honored um, that you are choosing to spend your time with us today. Um, the Bible says that while we were sinners, while we were still dead in our sin, that is when Christ came for us. Not when we were perfect, not, not when we were put together, but while we were yet sinners, while we were still in our graves, that is when Christ came for us. And in this next song, we're gonna sing about how the power of God can pull us out of that grave. The power of God brought Jesus out of the grave. And we know that story. And so as we're, as we're singing this song, would you just reflect on and remind yourself the, of the graves that, that Jesus has brought you out of, that his power and the glory of his presence um, has carried you out of as we sing. Let's do it.
like sweet, sweet honey on my head. Like the sound of symphonies in my ears. And like Next, we're going to move on into a time of communion. In Luke 22, 19, it says, do this in remembrance of me. Take the next few moments to remember that his body was broken for you and his blood was poured out for your forgiveness of all sins. Let's take communion together. Next, we're going to...
I want to share something awesome with you. In 2020, through Church Anywhere, we reached 146 countries and prayed with 1,467 people through multiple different online platforms. None of this would be possible without your generosity. The statement reigns true. When you give, lives are changed. So thank you for being a blessing. If you'd like to give, the link will be posted below. I'm really excited to hear the message that Patrick has today. Let's listen in. I've been a Pittsburgh Steelers fan for all of my life, as far back as I can remember. My mom's actually from Pittsburgh, so she brought it over with her when she moved to Illinois. Now, I think I made that news pretty open and widely available to you all, but you still might be a little bit angry with me over what we did last week to the precious Colts. But you Colts fans need to root for us now. You've got to be a fan of our Mason Rudolph-led team of backups against the Browns so that you can get into the playoffs. Funny how that works, huh? But don't let Randy know that you're rooting for them for, for reasons that I'll, I'll never understand. He has chosen the Browns as his team. So he's had a rough couple of decades. I, for one, am for the Colts this week. I'd rather have the new decade be just like the past ones with the Browns never getting to have any joy in football. A lot of you might already be asleep because you cannot care any less about football. It doesn't make any difference who gets into the playoffs at all. It's completely unimportant, right? And to those of you who would say that, I would say, how dare you? And those of you who don't care about football might also be wondering why in the world I would use personal pronouns when it comes to the Steelers. And to that I would say, you might have a point there. I don't know why, but when talking about the Steelers or when I'm cheering for the team, I always use personal pronouns, we, our, us, as if I'm somehow a part of the team, as if somehow my cheering and hollering or more recently my stress and anxiety and tears make any amount of difference to the Pittsburgh Steelers' success, as if me screaming at my television as a 130-pound, 5'11 dude to a bunch of fully grown and professional athletes is going to make a difference on whether or not we win. It's ridiculous, right? I don't do anything that sways the tide one way or the other. And even worse yet, I don't even really know the Steelers that well. I've never had a conversation with any person that was ever on the team. I've never even met anyone. I've been in Pittsburgh many times, and I've been around Heinz Stadium, but I've never actually been into that sta stadium. I've never been to a game. How can I use words like we, our, and us when talking about the Steelers? How can I say that I know the Steelers well? And yet, as we take a look back on 2020, and especially the church in 2020, I'm afraid that there are some scary parallels, some worrisome parallels between fans in the stands taking ownership of a team and people that believe in God but don't have any skin in the game. See, there was a Gallup poll released in 2019 that 87% of Americans say that they believe in God. And when I first heard that statistic, I was pretty encouraged by it. However, the more that I thought about the statistic, the question that kept popping into my head was, is that it? Is believing the pinnacle of a Christian life? Is that the absolute best thing that we can strive for as a follower of Jesus? In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus gives us an answer, and Jesus doesn't hold back any punches here. Jesus is preaching one of the most famous sermons in Matthew 5 through 7. If ever there was a blueprint on how to follow Jesus and how to get to know him, it would be to look intensely at this sermon and then to follow the commandments of Jesus to a T. Among the crowd that Jesus is preaching to, there are God-believers of all sorts, those who have believed because of their upbringing. It was ingrained into their family. There were those who believed because it granted them authority over people, like the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And there are those in the crowd who believe in Jesus because of what they can get from him. This is what Jesus says to that crowd of believers. Matthew 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Jesus is saying that a simple belief in God does not add up to much of anything. Belief does not equal salvation, eternal life, being saved, the kingdom of heaven. Whatever phrasing you've grown up with or you simply being a believer isn't it. 
the author of the book of James even goes one step further later on in the New Testament saying, oh, you believe in God? Oh, cool, awesome. The demons even do that. What would it look like for someone in 2020 to believe in God in their mind, maybe even say, Lord, Lord, right, but not truly experience the goodness of the kingdom of heaven? It might look like a life of check marks. Spend an hour going to church, check. Tell people I will pray for them, check. Say, I'm a Christian, check. No facts about God, check. You see, there's a difference between knowing of someone and actually knowing them. A lot of people believe that I exist, right? I hope those of you watching here believe that anyway. Some people know of me or know things about me, but there's a vast difference between knowing of or knowing things about someone and actually knowing them. For me, that category is private to a few close friends and family, and ultimately that category belongs solely to Abigail. She knows me more than anyone else. It wasn't always that way. We met in college and were part of a friend group that hung out and ate meals daily. We traveled to each other's houses on spring break, and Abigail and I even went on a mission trip together. And I was in love with her in that first year of knowing her, and probably pretty obviously embarrassingly so. And so I took my shot, and I figured it was obvious that we should be in a dating relationship. And so on a Sunday night, I asked her out on a date. And her response, wow, this is so brave. I knew pretty quickly that something probably wasn't going to go my way. She politely turned me down that night. But my pride was as bad as it is now, so for some reason I figured she just hadn't thought about it enough. So I gave her a day or two to really mull it over, and then I asked again, and again, she had the grace to say no without crushing me. I didn't get the hint until the third time that I asked and the third response of a no. And so we went our separate ways and found our ways back to being good friends a few years down the road. Acquaintance turned into friendship, it turned into dating, and it turned into an engagement and into marriage, and so it goes. At every stage, my knowledge of her increased, sure, but the thing that made the truest difference in a relationship was actually knowing each other, not just things, but getting to know her heart, her kindness, her grace, her personality. With each step in our relationship, we, be- we began to know each other more. What changed? Two things. Our proximity to each other changed. We grew closer to each other because we were around each other. And not only did our proximity change, but our time in close as well. Getting to know a person is best done through proximity and time. In order to move from being a person who believes in Jesus, one that just checks off things that we've labeled Christian, To move from that person to one that truly knows Jesus, that truly knows the power and grace and redemption and love that he has for the world. To know that Jesus takes a long time in the presence of Jesus. How else would a small group of average people 2,000 years ago change the entire world? It was because they spent a lot of time being close to the one who has the power to change it. And knowing Jesus is everything. Jesus says it himself in John 17 in a prayer. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ who you, you sent. Jesus gives us that equality of statement to know God is eternal life. That's what all of it is defined by. Salvation, heaven, getting saved is knowing God. That's where it can be found. That's at its core of eternal life. It's what it is based on is knowing God. Jesus promises two things in John 17 and in Matthew 7. Believing in God is not nearly enough and knowing God is everything. Jesus states that this is the whole thing, the big one. This is it. Knowing God is eternal, perfect life. While simply believing will not cut it. It doesn't get us there. It is in my best interest and your best interest to know God, to remain and stay close to Jesus for as much time as possible. It is imperative for the future of the church. It is imperative for you and your personal faith to begin the daily work of abiding with and in and around Jesus Christ. I keep thinking back to the statistic I shared earlier. 87% of Americans believe in God, but if 2020 has shown us anything, it's that the gap between believing God and knowing Him is wide. 
Now more than ever, we need to absolutely have everyone who calls themselves followers of Jesus to dive deep into their relationship with him, to focus on the presence of Jesus with everything that we have. We need all hands on tech. I was in my junior year of college, and for some reason I was asked to play piano for a student worship service. I could hit some chords, sure, but I had never played piano with, like, you know, a band before, and I definitely didn't know how to play piano for a worship set. So one night I had a friend who was really good at piano teach me what to do, what notes to play and how. Uh, we were in this huge building all alone, and I had to use the restroom real quick, and so I excused myself and went walking in the direction of the bathroom. If you are a man or a parent to a guy or maybe have ever seen a boy ever, you'll know that one of the most instinctual things for us to do when coming to a doorway is to jump up of the door frame. I don't know where this comes from, but it's at the core of who men are. If you ask one and they say they don't do this, they're either lying or they have subdued the urge to jump for years and they've forgotten what it means to be a man. So, of course, I come up to the doorway, and I get a full sprinting start, right? And I jump up, and I hit the door, and I smack my forehead on it. I think it was a shorter door frame than what, it, what I was used to, or maybe I just gained, like, a foot of vertical that I wasn't used to yet. I'm not sure. I think I might have looked something like this. This kid finna knock himself out. Oh, oh my gosh. Ouch. Anyway, there I was trying to regain my focus when I reach my hand up to feel my forehead and I bring it back down and it's covered in blood. So I'm freaking out, but I don't want to bother my friend with this and I definitely don't want them to know that I cracked my head open by just, you know, jumping into a dorm frame for no reason. So I go to the bathroom and I'm trying to like get all this blood off my forehead. I'm trying to make sure that the blood stops with like paper towels and all that sort of stuff and it's just not stopping. And at this point I had a thought. I'm not going to pass out and bleed out in a bathroom. That is not how I'm going to go out of this world. So I go get my friend. We get another friend to drive us to the hospital. We enter into the emergency room, emergency room, blood dripping onto their nice floor, and we get to the information sheet, and I go into the waiting room, and that's exactly what happens. I wait. I didn't know this at the time, but head wounds, I guess, bleed a whole lot more. Like, there's, like, that's a semi-normal thing, I guess. I don't know. Ask a doctor or something. They had someone come up to look at me and get back and give me a rag, and they walked back out of the waiting room, and then I continued to wait. And I waited, and I waited, and I waited. We arrived at the hospital probably around 10 p.m., and I didn't get thoroughly checked out and fixed until around 1 or 1.30 in the morning. I sat in that waiting room for three hours, and I was ticked. I was so frustrated because all they actually ended up doing was like gluing my forehead shut that at that point had stopped bleeding like two hours ago. What I found out later was that there was a drunk driving accident that came in just before I had, and it was an all hands on deck situation. A multiple person, multiple car collision happened and it required all the staff and all the doctors that were available. My injury was small potatoes compared to what was going on. See, when you know the urgency of a problem, you prioritize it. My bleeding forehead shouldn't take priority over someone fighting for their life in a car crash. And discipleship is that urgent need that takes precedence in our churches in the same way today. That is the most urgent need right now. If ever there was a time for all hands on deck, if there ever was a time where we know that the church is hemorrhaging, if ever there was a time where the church needs to become a group full of pastors and followers and knowers rather than believers, it is now. For a long time, I've been working with this statistic that 60 to 70 percent of Christian students will leave the church and cut ties with Jesus after they leave high school and live out on their own. However, new data suggests that that might not even be that good. A study by the Barna Group this year of Generation Z, so that's the generation of college-age students down, has suggested that of Christians in that generation, 10% are likely to become how we would describe as fully devoted followers of Jesus. 10% of the generation of Christians rising up are going to become disciples of Jesus. One in 10, a 90% exodus. That 
10% figure. One in 10 is not a thing that's up there, out there. Someone else's issue. That's one in 10 right here. One in 10 of you listening in. I'm not talking about an issue of the whole country because we're not going to be able to fix that one. I'm talking about your kids and my future kid. I'm talking about us. That's the world we can work in and live in. David Kinnaman, the leader of the Barna Group, who worked on that study, said that the only way that the American church survives something like this is with either an overwhelming move of God or if we start taking radical discipleship seriously. A discipleship that understands that we are the church, that we go beyond walls, beyond communities, into those neighborhoods and into families. We look different because we follow the perfect Jesus who wants to perfect us. Jesus wants to make us more generous, more loving, more peaceful, more kind. He wants to actually change our lives from the inside out in a way that reaches into our day-to-day lives far beyond an hour here. And that begins when we, when we become fixated on being in the presence of Jesus, reorienting our habits, our days, our lives around the presence because our walk with Christ, our relationship with Jesus, our Christianity cannot simply be a piece of our lives. It can no longer be something that happens whenever convenient. Jesus must become what we put our faith in, what we, become, or what we put our full life in. We must become everything. As a church, we're going to do that together in the month of January and beyond, beginning through prayer and scripture reading. We'll be spending time with Jesus as we travel with him through the Gospel of John. Every weekday, we'll read a chapter of John and have a devotional diving deeper into it. While throughout the week, we want to be a praying people, praying over our families, praying over ourselves, praying over our communities, praying that we might all become people who are completely defined by our proximity to Jesus. And on Wednesdays, we will come together as a complete church through Facebook and pray over and for each other. A full calendar of what's going on in the months of January will be posted on our Facebook page. In 2021, First Capital and Church Anywhere wants to be defined by knowing God through staying as close to Him as possible for as long as possible. And we want to be defined by actually doing what He says. First John gives us what it actually means to know God completely. We know that we have come to know Him if we keep His commands. When we begin to know God to the fullest, we serve usually Him by serving others. It's the same with any relationship. When Abigail and I continued to get closer, it continued a pattern, pattern of us serving one another. Being attentive to one another's needs led us to acts that brought joy to each other. God is a being without any need and His sacrifices in our direction will always vastly outweigh the things that we can do. And yet, Scripture still promises us that it brings joy to the Lord when we do what is good. It brings happiness to His being when we do what He has commanded and what He says to do. A life of knowing Jesus isn't about just living a normal life with a Jesus sticker tagged on. It's about actually allowing Jesus to control and command every part of our soul, every facet of our being should be defined by how you've surrendered it to Jesus. Every decision, every conversation, every action, every hour saturated with the light of Jesus and the overflow of the Holy Spirit that looks and feels like love and grace and truth and peace. It's a life that's vastly different, but vastly better than anything normal. So will you go together this year? Will you dive deeper into the renewal and revival that Jesus wants to bring into your life? Will you begin to follow Jesus with everything that you've got? Thank you for worshiping with us today. I pray you have a blessed 2021. Let me pray the scripture over you before we go. It's from number 6, 24 through 26. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. I pray you and your family have a blessed 2021, and we'll see you next week. Thank you for worshiping.